All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last workshop of the quarter, Modern Cryptography. Uh, this will be just me and Steven presenting. So be prepared for two hours of us just talking. Uh, it will be slightly different format from our normal workshops, uh, but hopefully you guys enjoy the show. Cool. So as I said, this is the last workshop of the quarter and the last workshop of our presidency. Um, for next week, we have CTF After Dark starting at 6 p.m. on uh, Wednesday and ending exactly seven days later at 6 p.m. So look out for new challenges uh, being up on our website. Um, the kickoff event will be 6 to 8 p.m. next week. We'll try to get food there so you guys can come out and enjoy some food in our challenges. Uh, CTF IRL has been postponed from tomorrow because of the rain to next Friday from 6.30 to 8.30. So you can head on to the IM field next week and test some grass. Um, and yeah, I think that is basically it for us. All right, so let's get into uh, what is modern cryptography. So buckle up, buckle up for a while, two hours of talking and math. Um, just warning you guys, be, be a little bit prepared. Um, so to explain what modern cryptography is, we really have to start from the beginning. Um, you can also enjoy our beautiful CSS on our, web, uh, on our website. Uh, so we'll first start off talking about classical cryptography. So classical ciphers, um, the reason why they're needed is information sharing. So one person wants to share information with another person without some like eavesdropper in the middle stealing their information. Um, so usually these are like symmetric. You have, you have like a key <laughs> that you use to um, change the message that you have into like some type of ciphertext. And also you use that same key to like decipher that message. Um, so you can think of it as like a key and a lock. Um, the reason why these are classical now is because the set of possible keys is often very limited. Um, it's not that big. And then there's a lot of techniques um, like brute force is like a perfectly valid technique for figuring out keys. And um, like the most famous one of like the classical ciphers is something known as the Enigma machine. This was used during Nazi Germany to like transmit military messages. Uh, and this was cracked by our father of CS, Alan Turing. Uh, so just, to, just goes to show like classical ciphers, even though they might be very, very cool. You might have done it in elementary school when you like did a Caesar cipher or something. They're not um, super useful in modern day. So to get into really into like modern cryptography, we have to first give a little bit of background uh, into group theory. So uh, first of all, what is a set? A set is just a group of things. Uh, this might sound a little bit obvious, but um, for example, the set of these slides forms a set, the set of all people at UCLA forms a set. And closure is something, um, this is a property for a set <laughs> where if you do something, you stay in that set. So for example, if you're on the surface of the earth and you walk north, south, east, or west, you still stay on the surface of the earth. So that means um, the surface of the earth is closed under uh, walking north, south, east, or west. However, if you jump, you leave the surface of the earth. So you leave the, that set. So it's not closed under jumping. And then uh, modulus is something that you might remember from like either math 61 or maybe CS 31. Uh, this is the remainder when you do division. So that I, so like for example, seven, when you divide by five, you get one remainder two. So that means seven is congruent to two mod five. This is how you pronounce this. Uh, hopefully most of this is kind of a little bit of review. Um, this is your favorite percent operator. Uh, also that's a picture of like Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day because like, like the clock modulus is like circular. Okay, so now ooh, let me make this. Oh, okay. I always just hide this. <laughs> okay, so why is group theory also known as abstract algebra? So this is another name for group theory. So to explain this, we have to look at our favorite equation, you know, one plus one equals two. Uh, this is in algebra, obviously, but let's abstract that all the way. So instead of numbers, Let's change these into variables. And instead of addition, we have uh, some symbol. So here, x, y, and z are elements of some set. 
Uh, they're not necessarily numbers. They're not necessarily anything. Um, they're just elements of a set. And then that star, uh, no, this is not necessarily multiplication. Uh, it's just a binary operation. So it takes two elements of that set and gives a, a third element of the same set. Um, so this is kind of like abstracting away all the algebra that you know. Um, so let's formally define a group. A group is a set and a binary operation. So what we kind of just talked about. And then there's some other requirements that make something a group. Uh, so for example, closure under that operation. If you take two elements, you use that operation on those two elements, you get a third element that's part of the same set. So for example, if one plus one equals two, then two has to be a part of that same set that one is also in if you want it to be a group. Um, some others are associativity. So this is like the A uh, operation B operation C is equal to if you put parentheses around the first two, uh, or if you put parentheses around the second two, they're equal. Um, there's also the existence of identity, which means that if you have, um, there exists something where if you do an operation on that something and something else, you get that something else back. So for example, if you have um, like addition, zero is the identity because anything plus zero equals itself. If you have multiplication, one is the identity because anything times one gives itself. And then the last thing is closure under inverses. So because we defined identity, there has to exist something in this set where if you take this element and then something that we call the inverse, you get the identity. So that always exists. Okay, so some examples of uh, groups, the integers under addition form a group. Um, this one has uh, identity zero, as I mentioned. Uh, the real numbers minus zero under multiplication form a group. Uh, that minus zero is very important because zero has no inverse under multiplication, right? There's nothing that you can multiply zero by to get one, the identity. Um, the rotations of a square, uh, that also forms a group under composition. So like, let's say you have a square, you rotate it 90 degrees, you get that square again. Or you can uh, rotate it 90 degrees twice and you get a rotation of 180 degrees. Or you can like rotate 180 degrees twice, you get like a rotation of 360, which is the same as the original square. So that also forms a group. Uh, and then like the rotations of a Rubik's cube also forms a really, really big and complicated group. Okay. So now I'll define order. This is a very common confusion point because order has multiple meanings. Hmm? Oh, okay. Uh, so order of a group is just the number of elements in the set. So basically the size of the set, but in order of an element, this is defined something different. It's the number of times you do the operation to itself to get the identity. So for example, uh, Okay, ignore this for now. I define it later. Uh, if you have six and uh, you you add it to itself seven times in like, and you take that mod seven, you get zero, right? Because six times seven, and then when you divide by seven, you get zero again. So um, under like a group where it's like mod seven, addition mod seven, uh, the order of six would be seven. Okay, that, that might have not made too much sense, but I'll explain it a little, more, uh, a little bit more later. So um, we really care about finite groups. Like there's infinite groups out there like the integers, uh, but they're not super applicable to cryptography. For cryptography, we care about finite groups. So addition under modulus is a group operation. So I'll take it back to like the, the simplest example that we know, which is like bitwise addition, right? This is like, uh, Zero plus zero equals zero, zero plus one equals one, one plus zero equals one, and one plus one equals zero. You can see that uh, it, this uses the set zero, one. There's only two elements in it. You use the addition sign. Uh, this is really addition mod two because one plus one equals two. And then when you divide by two, you get one remainder zero. So it, you get zero back again. Yes? Why do we want to care about finite groups? Uh, finite groups, it's easier to like, Everything, when you take it like mod something else, you get like a, a finite group. So it's easier to deal with. If you have an infinite group, um, you can't really see like the cycles in it. Uh, also, if you have like 
yeah. requirement group like mod, it kind of obscures the operation because if you have if you just do like a commit group like the ring of image integers, you try to just like like take those logarithms like a to the b. You can just take a normal logarithm where if you have like into a mod of a prime, you'd have to take the discrete log, which is a different operation and it's much harder to do. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is the example that I just gave with zeros and ones. Um, but if we just highlight which ones are zeros and which ones are ones, and uh, I can think of another group that looks really similar to this, uh, and that is uh, this group. So if we have just the set one and negative one, and instead of plus, you do multiply, you get almost the exact same thing, right? Instead of zero plus zero equals zero, you get one times one equals one. Instead of zero plus one equals one, you get one times negative one equals negative one. Instead of zero plus one plus zero equals one, and negative one times one equals negative one, and then so on. So you can see that like these two groups, even though they have different sets and different operations, they're almost identical. So this is known uh, as an isomorphism. So you can map these elements to each other. So that would be known as like iso, which is like same morph is like change. So you can change one group from another with like the exact same structure. Uh, and this group, we can generalize it to be like z mod 2z. So this is like z slash 2z. z is the set of integers. So imagine the set of integers, and you like mod it by every single even integer. The remainders can only be 0 or 1. So that's why we have this. Oh, and also this is like the symbol you, you do to say like two things are isomorphic. So this group is squiggly line equal to that group. Okay, so what about z mod n z under multiplication? Uh, does it always form a group? And the answer is only in cer certain cases. So let's imagine the group z mod 4 z under multiplication. So this is um, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And when you multiply, you always uh, take it mod 4. So the first one of the things that makes something a group is it has to have inverses, right? One is its own, it, its own inverse because 1 times 1 equals 1. Right. And then three times three equals nine. And when you divide by four, you get one. So three is its own inverse as well. But two has no inverse because every time you multiply two by something, you get an even number. And when you mod by four, you still get an even number. So it's impossible to get one. And similarly, zero, when you multiply with anything, you get zero. So these are impossible. So that means like for this to be a group, like two and zero cannot be in the set. So elements, like every element in like the group under multiplication has to be co-prime to four, aka it shares no factors. Um, so if we remove these two, we get just one and three, and we can do it um, like z or divide by, or use multiply and then mod by four. So uh, this star is the subgroup. So you take the group and then you remove some elements. Uh, the ones that have multiplicative inverses, we denote it with a star. So z mod 4z star is these two elements. This is isomorphic to z mod 2z because one is its, oh, its own inverse. So one is acting as like the identity because one times one equals one. And then three times three equals one, three times one equals three, and one times three equals three. So you can see the structure of this is identical to the group that we were describing previously. Okay, so uh, there's a lot more math to be done, but um, there's one result that like, if you want the numbers one, two, all the way up to n minus one under multiplication mod n to be a group, it's only a group when n is a prime number. Uh, and you can kind of think of it like, uh, mm -hmm. which, um, which numbers are co-prime to n? Uh, and then only the ones that are co-prime can exist in the group. Uh, so when n is a prime, Every single number is co-prime. If n is anything but a prime, there's going to be some number smaller than it that is um, not co-prime to it. So this is usually denoted z mod pz, uh, the multiplicative group of z mod pz, where p is a prime. And um, you can also think about like Fermat's little theorem, which I have copied here, uh, as to like why that's uh, that works. Okay, some other properties of this group is that it has order p minus one. So remember this group's order is like the size of the set. Uh, so this is a little bit self-explanatory. If you have uh, one, two, three, all the way up to p minus one, 
then there's p minus one elements. Um, and then taking powers is random and always generates the group. So these are, um, taking powers is random. It's kind of like, what does random mean in this case? It means that if you have like everything, like uh, the numbers one all the way up to p minus one, and you take powers of any random number, it kind of like bounces around. There's no real pattern to it. It doesn't like go every two and then it goes back and then loops again. Uh, it's very, very random. And then generates the group means that like you're gonna hit every single element when you take powers. Uh, so that's kind of like generating it. With mm -hmm. any element, you can create the entire group. Uh, and then the order of ele every element divides the order of the group. Uh, so that means for every element, if you take it to some power, okay and that equals one, that number has to divide P minus one. Okay, that was a lot of math, uh, but the real thing that we really care about is that if we have this problem, A to the power of Z, A to the power of B equals C in Z mod PZ, if I tell you A and C, it's really hard to find B. Uh, and this is also known as the discrete log problem that Gary mentioned. Uh, if this was not in Z mod PZ, you can just take the log uh, base B, uh, base A of both sides, and you get B. Okay, so snap back to reality. That was a lot of math. Uh, as a reminder, why were classical ciphers bad? First of all, you need to know a key, and it's hard to like transmit information about a key since that's like the point of cryptography is to like transmit information. If you can transmit information about a key, why not just use it? Use that same method to transmit information. And it's easy to crack using computers. So now we have to kind of shift perspective from cryptography to math because uh, ASCII encoding allows us to abstract away any information. So any text as just a sequence of numbers, right? It's all ones and zeros in a computer. Same thing with images, videos, you can all express that as ones and zeros. And in base two, those are all just numbers. So we can do a lot of math on it. All right, does anyone have any questions about anything that I talked about so far? Anyone on Zoom or have any questions? You can type it in the chat too. All right. If not, I will move on to the next. Yes. Yeah. So discrete log is a to the power of b equals c. So a to the power of b is just a you apply the operation to a again, b times, right? So if it's a to the power of two, it'd be a operation a is equal to c. If a to the power of three, it's a operation a operation a. Uh, and if I tell you that, if I give you the base and I give you what um, the result is in z mod pz, um, you can't find what b is. So uh, you don't know if like it's a to the power of b equals c or a to the power of b equals c plus p, where a to the power of b equals c plus some kp. You don't know what that k is since it's in z mod pz. So you, you get information taken away from it, which is why it's really hard. The best way to solve it is to guess and check, basically. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I will move on to the next part, which is Diffie-Hellman. So this is um, also known as the key exchange. This was invented by two people, one person named Diffie, the other named Hellman, as you can probably guess. Uh, so this is sharing a secret. Uh, you can't use the same encryption scheme because you need a key, uh, and you don't really care what that key is. Uh, you don't want to decide that beforehand because then you're just sharing information. You just want like two people to have the same key. Um, and this relies on something that's easy to do, but hard to reverse. So the standard analogy is just mixing paint. So let's say I tell you I have 1.7 parts red and one part blue, and then I mix it. So let's say you have that red, you have that blue, pal, you get that purple. Uh, but if I give you that purple, it's really hard to tell like what the proportions of red and blue are. So for example, if I give you green, this specific green, can you tell me how much red, how much yellow, and how much blue go into it? It's really, really hard. The best algorithm is to like guess some proportion, mix it, and check it. And you see, oh, maybe it needs a little more yellow. Next time, add a little bit more yellow, and then keep on trying. So this is like a uh, easier to understand version of the problem. Okay, so suppose 
that Alice and Bob, which are two people, they want to share a paint color. Uh, and they don't really care about what it is, just that they have the same paint color and they can like paint their houses with it or something they want to match. But they don't want E to match with their color because they're they're mean and bullies and they don't want uh, Eve to be part of their family. So they mix two colors, color A and color B individually, and they don't tell anyone that. They agree on a public color, color C. So this is like something they tell everyone. We're gonna use color C. So Alice mixes color A and C in the same proportions in the privacy of her home. Bob mixes color B and C in the privacy of his home, and then they send it to each other. So Alice gets B and C, Bob gets A and C. Uh, when Alice gets B and C, she adds A to it because she has it. So she gets A and B and C. And then when Bob gets it, gets A and C, Bob adds B to it. So he also gets A and B and C. So now they arrive at like this shared secret. What Eve knows is C, which is the public color, B and C, and A and C. And uh, because it's really hard to split paint into its components, uh, you can't really split B and C into B and C. Same thing with A and C. So the best that Alice can do, or the best that Eve can do, is probably do A and C and B and C. But that doubles the proportion of C in the color. So she's going to arrive at the incorrect color. Um, so this is kind of like the paint version of Diffie Hellman. So now let's take a look at the actual math version. So suppose that Alice and Bob want to share a number. Uh, remember, keys are just numbers because they're information, right? Uh, they don't really care about what it is, just that they have a number. They can use that key later on to encrypt actual uh, useful messages. Uh, instead of mixing two colors, they choose two numbers, A and B, separately. They agree on a public prime base P and a public generator G. Uh, the reason why they, they do this is uh, if you have a prime base, then a generator is anything that's smaller than a prime and is not one. So Alice computes G to the power of A. Uh, and remember, for everything beyond this, we're taking everything in Z mod PZ. So G to the power of A mod P, basically. In the privacy of her home, Bob computes G to the power of B mod P in the privacy of his home. Uh, and then they send those computer numbers to each other. Alice receives g to the power of v from Bob, takes it to the power of a, so she gets g to the power of b, a, b to the power of a. And then Bob receives g to the power of a, takes it to the power of b, resulting in g to the power of a to the power of b. And if you remember your exponent laws from thing algebra 2, you remember that something to the power of something is just multiplying the two exponents. And multiplication is commutative, so you can swap around the order. So you arrive at the exact same shared secret. Uh, so again, this relies on the fact that instead of paint being very hard to like decompose, it relies on the fact that if I give you g to the power of a mod p, and I tell you g, it's really hard to find a, the discrete log problem. OK, so when numbers get really, really big, uh, classical computers die, like in the GIF, uh, relies on the hardness of discrete log. And now you can use the shared key for other ciphers. So now we'll be getting into the actual ciphers that can use the keys. Uh, two different types of ciphers, stream and block ciphers. <clears throat> so stream is like the skinny version of the cipher. Block is the chunky version. Uh, so stream is just like you get one bit and then uh, you like XOR with a key and you get one bit out. Block, you take n bits and then you get n bits out using the same key. But these two kind of sound like the same, right? Just instead of using one bit, you use n bits. So what's the actual difference? So if anyone has taken CSM51A or ECM16, does anyone remember what this is? This might be a little bit of a little bit traumatic, but this is what we call a ripple adder. Uh, it takes it, it basically adds two numbers, takes the carry out of like the, the least significant digit and then adds it to the next because you might have carry. Uh, and this is basically what it looks like, right? You, you have two numbers, A and B as input and possibly a carry in, and then you get the sum and possibly another carry 
carry in or carry out that turns into a carry in. So this is kind of like uh, what um, the block cipher, how the block cipher works. So uh, you, you get your data, you split it into blocks and every single time you encrypt that block with the key and that gives you that block cipher text. But during this encryption, it also gives you like a secondary output that you can use as input into the next chunk so that like every chunk after the first chunk will depend on the previous chunk. Uh, and this has many, many benefits. Uh, so stream ciphers are susceptible to bit flipping attacks. So let's say this is the cipher text. You don't really understand what it is. You just know that this bit is very important and it represents some money amount. You can tamper with this bit. So instead of saying send Bob $10, if you flip some bits and you get 37, you get send Bob $30. So even without knowing how to decipher this, if you know that this bit is important or these bits, this byte or whatever, uh, you can change it so that like information gets changed. However, if you have block ciphers, if you change something, uh, the rest of the message becomes jumbled because it relies on like that block being like that exact block. So if you change something here, everything else gets jumbled. Uh, and then that allows you to have shorter keys. In a stream cipher, you technically need to have a key the exact length of your text uh, or longer. If you have a block cipher, it just has to be the length of a block. All right, any other questions that came up during that chunk? Yes. So uh, it sounds like block has a lot of benefits with the stream cipher. Mm -hmm. Do people still use stream ciphers at all? Or mm, good question. I think people still use stream ciphers in like checksums, uh, because they're fast to compute. Uh, you don't have to like wait for the previous one to finish because you can execute things in parallel. Um, but I think that is the extent that which I know. That's like the main benefit of stream ciphers over block ciphers. Is stream ciphers can take an arbitrary length. But like you can take block ciphers and like mess with them, like you know, CBC, right? It's like basically turns it into a stream cipher. So there's no, there's not really much of a point to the stream cipher. It's just you say yes, right? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Alrighty. Okay. So now I'll talk about the state of the art technology that we're using right now, RSA. Uh, this next chunk might be a big chunk, so just a warning. Pretend that we're like 10 years ago and this is the state of the art. <laughs> so uh, RSA stands for Revesh Shamir Adelman, which is like Diffie Hellman, but instead of two people, you know how three people, amazing. Uh, this is asymmetric, which is different from symmetric because that means the keys for encoding and decoding are different. So you can think of it as like a key and a lock. If I give you an open lock, you can lock it really easily, but you can't unlock it really easily. Um, so Alice can send Bob the unlocked lock. Bob can lock, like get a chest, lock it, and then give it back to Alice. And then Alice can use her key to open the lock. Um, and like any other person, intercepting the lock chest will not be able to open it. This is used in HTTPS, TLS handshake, and other things. So it's quite important. Um, yeah. So the way it works in terms of math is that let's first suppose we have four numbers, M, N, E, and D, such that this property holds. M to the power of E to the power of D is congruent to M mod N. This might seem like a very random property, but we'll see why it's relevant in a quick second. Uh, so here, the public key is E and N. Uh, so whatever you're taking the mod to in this first exponent, and the private key is D. M is the message that Bob wants to send. Okay, so I move that equation up there. Bob knows the public key E and N and wants to send M to Alice because that's his message. He computes M to the power of E mod N because he knows all three, uh, three numbers and then sends that to Alice. Alice receives this takes it to the power of D, uh, and then M to the power of E to the power of D is equal to M mod N, right? So she gets the original message back. 
that almost seems like too short, too easy. How does this work? Uh, the reason why, um, like the, the difficulty of this is not in the actual algorithm, it's how you get these numbers M, E, D, and M. Because M can be anything. M is not like agreed upon beforehand because that's the secret message. So you need E, D, and M such that this works for any M. So yeah, how do you find E, D, and uh, let's just say N instead of M, such that this works for any M. Uh, so to start, you first get two really, really big primes, P and Q, and you set N equal to the product of this. Remember, um, prime factorization is another one of those problems that's really, really hard. It's easy to multiply two primes together. It's really hard to factorize it, especially if they're two really big primes. Uh, so quick question, how many numbers less than N are co-prime? This is kind of uh, a complicated question. I guess a little bit complicated. Um, so to like kind of break it down, one over P of them, like one over P of the numbers less than N have P as a factor because every P numbers you get P, right? And then another P numbers you get two P, another P you get three P and P, two P, three P obviously have P as a factor. So one over P of them have P as a factor. With the same argument, one over Q of them have Q as a factor. So the number of numbers which don't have P or Q as a factor, if one P of them have P as a factor, then P minus one in parentheses divided by P of them do not have P as a factor. Does that kind of make sense? Like one minus one over P. Uh, and the same thing for one over Q, you get Q minus one in parentheses divided by Q. So the number of numbers who don't have P or Q as a factor is N, the total number of numbers. And you multiply that by P minus one over P and then Q minus one over Q. And this is n is equal to p times q, that simplifies to p minus one times q minus one. Uh, and this entire thing, like how many numbers less than n are co-prime to n? This is also known as Euler's totient function, uh, which you might have heard of in some math classes. Okay, so another function, the Carmichael function is denoted lambda of n. And this is the smallest m such that a to the power of m is congruent to one mod n for all a. So this is kind of like the thing that we want. For any a, you get you take it to the power of m and you get one. This is slightly different. We, we want it to be equal to a, but um, this is close enough that we can manipulate it a little bit. Um, to calculate this, uh, there's a quick and easy formula, which is the lowest common multiple of q minus one and q minus one. The reason for that is that if something to the power of m is congruent to one mod n, that means m is the order of a, right? This is by definition of the order of an element in a group. And we said that the order has to divide the size of the group, right? The order of an element has to divide the order of the group, which is the size of the group. Here, the size of the group is p minus one times q minus one because you're taking a mod n. So everything has to divide p minus one or q minus one. So you just take the lowest common multiple you get a number that satisfies that. Does that kind of make sense? I said a lot of words really fast. Okay. Uh, and then to get E and D, uh, once you have like this lambda of N, it's actually fairly straightforward. You just pick any random E such that E is co-prime. Uh, and you can easily find this by checking if something is co-prime by using Euclid's algorithm, which computes the GCD of two numbers. If the GCD of E and lambda N is one and the co-prime. Uh, so you just pick a random number, check if GCD is one. If it doesn't work, pick another random number. Um, there's only so many factors that this can have. And then the other one is uh, you just have to find E times D is congruent to one mod um, lambda of N. And Euclid has another algorithm, this time called extended Euclid's algorithm, I can find it. Um, so once you have E times D is congruent to one mod lambda of N, you can kind of see like, if you take a to the power of e times d, then it's a to the power of m, and then plus one more because of this n. So you have one times a, so you get a back again for all a. So yeah, uh, that was kind of a lot. I see chat has kind of popped off. Has anyone asked anything? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, now, you might be thinking, where does quantum come in? 
So like RSA sounds like a really, really good algorithm. Um, but now with recent developments, it's actually possible to, or it's not possible yet to crack it, but in the horizon, people have seen ways to crack RSA and that can uh, crack like HTTPS, can see all your bank passwords and stuff. And the reason why is quantum. Okay, so what is quantum? We're not gonna talk about quantum particles too much um, because physics is bad, um, but ACM Hack has a really good slide deck on an, a gentle intro to quantum computing that's really good. And I recommend you guys check it out if you're interested in this. Um, but starting off, uh, the reason why this is relevant is that uh, quantum particles have this uh, property called superposition. So instead of a normal bit, a bit is either a zero or a one, right? But a quantum bit, also known as a qubit, has a probability of either being zero or one. Uh, and those two probabilities add up to one because it has to be either zero or one. Um, it's kind of annoying to think about because it also gets into like complex numbers and stuff. Um, but yeah, instead of and, or, or not gates that you use to manipulate bits, like one and one is equal to one, but one and zero is equal to zero. You have quantum gates, which are C naught, H, S, T, and other gates. Um, they just act on qubits the same way. And uh, the important thing is that like, when you measure a quantum state, so let's say this has a 50% chance of being zero and 50% chance of being one. When you measure it, you get 100% chance of being zero, or you get 100% chance of being one. You don't retain the quantum state once you measure it. So that means if there are n bits as output of a quantum program, as soon as you measure it, you can only extract n bits of information, no matter how complicated that quantum state is. So um, this is why quantum algorithms are usually ran many, many, many times to estimate the correct answer. And there's also some other factors like quantum computers really suck right now. Um, and they're very, very error prone. Okay, so I'm gonna debunk some of the common misconceptions about quantum because people have probably heard that word thrown around a lot. Um, are quantum computers better? Faster? No, they're a lot slower than classical computers. Like if you give the same algorithm to both of them, quantum computers will take much, much longer. More accurate? Also no, quantum computers have like really, really high error rates. Um, I think it's like orders of magnitude higher than classical computers, but can they solve more problems? Potentially, um, because quantum computers can use some quantum algorithms that uh, instead of taking exponential time, it can take uh, like a lot faster time. Okay, is everyone gonna have a quantum computer sometime in the future? Possibly, but probably very, very not likely because classical computers are inherently better than quantum computers at some things just because we've worked on them for so long. Uh, so quantum computers are not like completely better than classical computers. Uh, will qu quantum computers wake up alive and turn us all into slaves? Uh, go check out ACM AI for that. And does the quantum realm exist? Don't see Ant Ant-Man and the Lost Quantum Mania because it's a terrible movie. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit, a tiny bit about quantum complexity theory. So you guys have probably heard the question P equals NP, which is like a classical problem. Are any, or is everything that can be solved in like non-polynomial time actually polynomial? But there's actually a quantum version of this uh, called BQP is equal to BPP or not. So BQP is like the set of problems that you can solve with a quantum machine in polynomial time with a bounded error. There's some error term because quantum computers, as I said, are really bad and they always make errors. Uh, and then BPP is like the same version, but with like probabilistic computers. Um, so it might be possible that these two are the same which means that everything you can solve with a quantum computer, you can solve with a classical computer. So quantum computers might not even be like better than classical computers of what they can solve, but this is still something that has not been determined yet, so we don't know. So um, it's predicted that BQP is bigger than BPP, um, but this is still like, it's like the P equals MP problem, it has not been solved yet. So the quantum advantage might not even exist. <laughs> but I'll show you some things that kind of show uh, why it's likely that the quantum advantage exists just because there's no classical algorithms to solve. 
So for example, the, the easiest thing for a quantum computer to do is the Deutsch Joza algorithm, which is like, if I give you a function and tell you that the function takes in as input some string of length n, so like some string of bits, zeros and one of length n, and outputs either zero or one. Uh, and this function is either constant, which means on every single input, it outputs the same output, like zero, or it always outputs one, or it's balanced, which means on half of the inputs, it outputs zero, and exactly the other half, it outputs one. Um, to determine if a function is constant or balanced, uh, classically, with a classical computer, you need to call it on half of all the inputs plus one more, right? Uh, so that requires two to the power of n, because that's the set of inputs divided by two, and then you add one more to it. Because you might have just like, you might test it a lot of times uh, on a lot of inputs, and you keep on getting like it equals zero. So you don't know if it's constant or balanced because it might just like, you might be keep on choosing the inputs that equals zero, even though it's balanced. <laughs> so this uh, classically has a time complexity of two to the power of n, but quantum can solve this in constant time with exactly one call. Um, and the reason for this is that it can put like the input into a superposition of all of the inputs and then evaluate it all at the same time uh, and then get something out of it, which is kind of cool. But as we said, there might just not be a classical algorithm that's fast enough to do this with like enough error. Okay, so more interesting algorithm is Grover's algorithm. So this kind of relates to CS a little bit more. This is an unstructured search, which means looking through an array for some element. Um, and then uh, specifically that satisfied property X. So it might be like that property is being equal to seven. So, so I'll give you a really long array and tell you to find the first element that equals seven. Um, so usually like classically, you just look through the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, and so on. It takes O of N, but quantum, you can evaluate it in O of square root n, which is faster. Okay, and then the actual interesting algorithm that relates to cryptography is Shor's algorithm. This is the one that made quantum computing relevant to like the general public. Uh, and it solves integer factorization in polynomial time. So this would break RSA if quantum computers were powerful enough. Um, it's actually quite complicated. It uses many sub algorithms, such as finding the order of like a finite, uh, of an element in a finite group, phase finding, which I won't even bother explaining, and quantum Fourier transform, because Fourier transform wasn't complicated enough. Uh, there's a really good minute physics video, if you're interested in it, um, that explains a lot. So it converts this complexity of integer factorization from exponential, which is like some number to the power of n, to polylogarithmic time, which is like log to some power of n. So cryptography is broken? Not quite. So first of all, uh, quantum computers are still like really, really baby. Uh, like for one of my uh, project assignments for CS238, which is a quantum class, we had to run something on an actual quantum computer. It took waiting like two hours in a queue for IBM's quantum computer. And we, can, we finally ran it on three qubits. So three qubits, we got three bits of information uh, out of that after two hours. So not the most powerful computers right now, uh, but because math people are looking out into the future, uh, they want to do something that like quantum computers cannot break in polynomial time. So math people thought of harder math and thought of post-quantum cryptography. Okay, so now this is the final, final portion that I'll be talking, uh, which is lattices. Okay, so imagine you open up your favorite note-taking app uh, I don't know if you can see it from back there, but there's dots on this app. Um, this is good notes. Uh, and this is an example of a lattice. Okay, so the mathematical definition is a discrete subgroup of Euclidean space, assuming it contains the origin, closed under addition and inverses. Every point has a neighborhood in which it is the only lattice point. Uh, so that sounds like a mouthful, but basically in normal language, it's just the points of a grid. Uh, and you can stretch it, you can compress it somehow, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a grid in 2D space. So like if you just have a line and you draw points along that line, such as like at all the integers on a number line, 
then that is a lattice. You can do it in 3D space, you can do it in 4D space, you can do it in however many dimensions you want. Uh, so remember group theory? This is basically just a group that also has a basis. Um, so you'll use a little bit of linear algebra here. And uh, it has to be like with that basis, every single point can be represented by an integer multiple of it. So let's say your basis is like the normal coordinate grid and you have like one zero and zero one. Then like everything is gonna be an integer multiple of one zero plus an integer multiple of zero one. Um, so you can name them in Z mod N or sorry, Z to the power of N. So every single point you can name it as like a tuple of integers. So here's an example. If n equals two, which means this is two dimensional, this is flat. Uh, this is only a part of a lattice because lattices are infinite. Uh, but let's assume that like this is infinite. If we name this point as zero, zero, the origin, and let's say we name two bases because this is two dimensions. Uh, so let's call this point zero, one. And, oh, this point as one zero. So once we have these two bases, we can number every single other point as just like a linear combination of this. Because if this is zero, th this is zero one, this is one zero, then if you add these, if you remember like vector addition, you just move like the arrow, the bottom of the arrow to the top of the previous one. Uh, so this would have to be one one. So you can number it all like this. So zero, 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 one, zero, negative one, one, negative. Uh, that should say negative one, one, uh, negative one, negative one, and so on. Okay, uh, you can also name these in different ways. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like your normal coordinate graph. Uh, you can go the other way. And by changing the bases, you change like the coordinate of every single point. So what is the hard problem in lattice theory? Uh, we talked about like integer factorization or um, the discrete log in uh, in the other, in like group theory. Uh, in lattice theory, <coughs> it's something known as the shortest vector problem. So if I give you a lattice, which is like a set of points, uh, can you find the two points that are the closest together inside this entire lattice? So given a lattice and then a basis for this lattice and a distance function, which is like, which is also known as a norm, which like calculates the, distances between, you want to find the shortest non-zero vector, which is like minimizing this distance function. Um, so far, there have not been any quantum algorithms to solve it, um, which is not to say that there will never be. Um, it might just be that people haven't thought of it. Um, but there's also some other problems that use lattices that people generally regard as like quantum proof, uh, such as like the closest vector problem. If I give you any vector that's not necessarily in this lattice, can you find the closest point on this lattice to, um, to this vector? So again, this is not necessarily in two dimensions. It can be in many, many, many dimensions. And because everything is integer based, we can encode bits, like bits of information as multiples of the bases. So this is where like information goes into a lattice and then you can use that lattice, do some things with it. Uh, and then like give that lattice back to someone and then they have to do it. Um, the closest vector problem relies on an error term. So let's say like, like a broad overview is, of this is person A sends person B some vector that's been like translated using this um, lattice. Person B adds a tiny bit of error to it and then like uh, sends it back to person A after doing some other transformations person A has to undo it and then find like the, the error to find like the closest point that it, like person B moved it from. That kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's um, basically like the gist of the closest vector problem. Okay, so that is the end of my portion. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yes. Uh, can you explain how the beginning <laughs> of like lattices work. So it's like mm -hmm. you have like your, your string of bits for your for your index. How do you go about producing like the lattice problem? Yeah. So um if I give you a set of bases, you can think of it as like a vector, right? A bunch of bases. 
um, you can convert your information into a matrix of ones and zeros. You can do it like this way, or you can do it vertically, or you can do it diagonally, however, however you want. And if you multiply a matrix by a vector, you get a vector back. So that's kind of how you encode it into a different lattice. So, 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 sorry, so the, so your, your input vector is just your, the lattice is the vector. Your input is a matrix. Okay, so so how do you uh, take like a is this equal one by n? Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you go about producing it? Do you do choose an arbitrary like size? Yeah, you first choose the lattice of size n, and then you can like oh, zero okay. pad if needed or something. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. I think so. You can pad it. Yeah. Any other questions? The error term? Oh, okay. So the, the um, Person B adds a little bit of error so that you can't compute it using the lattice and then like transforms it in some way and then gives it back to person A. So person A has to find the shortest vector in order to like decode, decode it. Yes. How does that not become a hard problem for so 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 like the the equivalent of T is thing is that person B by error? How does that not become a hard problem for? So person A doesn't have to find the closest vector. The eavesdropper has to find the closest vector in order to decode whatever person B sent. So, okay, so, so let's see if I can So what is sent from person A to person B is the lattice, right? Yes. And then that, that space is an error replied by person B. Mm -hmm. And then the, the new uh, lattice plus error is sent back to person A, and they're able to. So, how, like, how, how, how are they able to decode these things? I haven't looked into the math too much. Uh, I mostly just watch a YouTube video about it, but there is some math way to decode it. Like, it's, it's very math heavy. Um, but I think it mostly relies on like this being like many, many dimensions. The more dimensions it has, the harder this problem is. So I think that's the that's the main part of it. Like the complexity goes goes up a lot when you add a lot of dimensions. Okay. But so you put some bound on the error that you can encode a message. Gives the error which gives the message well the the error itself is you don't really care about the error too much you just care like where where the closest thing is um because like the error is just like some wavering around this lattice point. um and that just makes it hard for um another like uh another eavesdropper to tell like where the original lattice point was Cool. Any other question? Yes. So when you see the shortest path, you just want the length of the path, or you want to know the path is there? You just want to find the closest point. Mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. You don't care about like how close it is, but like if you find the closest point, you can just subtract to find the distance. So it's basically equivalent. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I will hand it off to Stephen then. All right, how do you get this set up? <laughs> you can like unplug and plug it in. Okay, just gonna mess up the Zoom. Oh, actually, yeah, maybe. I'll just plug it in for it. Let me join this. <laughs> No, 
Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, cool, cool. Can I make this full screen or do I just leave it like this? Uh, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Oh, wait, what happened? Oh, projector died. No way. Wait, it looks like it's still on. Oh, uh, actually, Gary, you just put in your earbuds. Oh, yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Big brain. Let's give it a second. <laughs> No signal? Uh, just give it a second. Okay. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Oh, I'm on there twice. How do we hide the participants? <laughs> uh, screen. No. Oh my god. <laughs> See, you just hide non video participant. Uh, okay. I mean, I guess it's sharing. Wait, I can turn off video. No, 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 no. <clears throat> Oh, okay, I'm no good way. with the video on or off, but okay, so it's both. It's fine. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, it disappeared again. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes of my life. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um. Okay, so this is modern cryptography theory. Basically, we'll be using math in a different way. There will be more proofs and probability, but there won't be. There will be some group theory, only a very little bit. It won't be the same kind of like 
non-invertible um, operation kind of thing, at least not in the same sense. Um, all right, so the first thing we're gonna start with is called one-way functions, which is like the basis of um, modern cryptography, right? So the idea is something that works in one way, right? So we wanna be able to go one way with this function, but we don't wanna be able to go the other way quite as easily. So intuitively, um, there's something about a one-way function that only works in one way, right? So we're gonna say just like colloquially, easy to compute, but hard to invert, right? So that doesn't really mean that much um, to us as like mathematicians, computer scientists. So we need to formalize these concepts of like easy to compute and hard to invert. So does anyone wanna start us off, have any ideas what these might mean? Okay. Um, so generally, when we say something's easy to compute, especially in computer science, we mean that you can do it in polynomial time, right? So our function f is going to belong to the class P, right? Hard to invert is a little bit more vague, right? Because there are some things we can't invert, right? But that's that wouldn't be useful for cryptography, right? If you could do the function, but you couldn't decrypt it, then there would be no use for that, right? So we want to say like, it's going to only be inverted with some probability, right? So let's say we have some adversary A, um, and this adversary is gonna be some computer in PPT, whoops, uh, or BPP, which is the class Jerry mentioned earlier. Basically, it outputs the correct answer with at least some baseline probability. Um, and we're gonna say, if we give it the output of the function, on some input x. So we're going to give a the output of f on some input x. And we're going to say it's going to output a guess for what the original input was. Um, and we want this guess to be correct, meaning that it's a correct inverse with negligible probability. So what we mean by negligible um, going forward is that it's going to be uh, it's going to be less than the reciprocal of any polynomial, right? Um, for all n sufficiently large. Okay, so that was kind of a lot. The formal definition is here. I'll just let you guys look at it for a second. It's not that important to understand everything that's going on right here. But the way cryptographers like to think of these kinds of things is as a game, right? So you have two players. Um, on the left-hand side, you have your function f, which is trying to be a one-way function. And on the right-hand side, you have your adversary a, which is trying to invert f, right? So a is going to say, OK, if I pick this natural number c, I think that I can invert you with probability at least 1 over n to the c for all natural numbers n, at least at some certain bound. And he's going to send that C over to F. And F is going to say, OK, I have your C. And now I think as long as you give me an input that's at least this big, you're not going to be able to invert um, what I've computed, right? So then some third party is going to generate a bunch of Xs, like X1, X2, X3. F is going to compute the function on all of those and send the results to A, and A is gonna send back some guesses, right? X1 prime, X2 prime, X3 prime. And so if A is correct with probability exceeding this value one over N to the C, um, where N is like the length of these strings, then A is gonna win, and F is not a one-way function. Um, but if A doesn't exceed that probability, then F wins, and F is a one-way function. The time complexity is different in both directions. Um, is this a question? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, let me close the chat. Jerry, how do you close this? <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay. Oh. No way, bro. <laughs> Someone let me know what the questions in the chat are so I don't have to have this happen again. Which question is it? Oh, oh there okay. we go. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm just gonna. Ideally, the next slide would have been like had animations, but I'm just going to let you guys tell me, like, do any of you know something that you at least think is a one-way function? Okay. No, that's cool. Yeah, Benson. Um, that could maybe be a candidate depending on... Um, when in history you look at it. Um, but the the big the big deal here is that like in all these cryptography proofs and stuff, you'll always see like assume that one-way functions exist. And the big deal is we don't know if they exist. Um, Cause imagine you had a function that you could compute in polynomial time, but you couldn't invert in polynomial time, not even with negligible probability, right? So, um, if you can compute it in polynomial time, that means if I gave you some x and a y, and I told you that y equals f of x, you could go ahead and verify that for me, right? Like you could just plug x into the function, compute it in polynomial time, and then say, are these equal? Uh, yes or no, right? So that means that verifying it is polynomial time, which means it's an NP problem, right? Um, but basically, if you can't invert it, that means that P is not equal to NP, right? So the existence of one-way functions implies that P equals P is not equal to NP, which is still an unsolved problem, right? So we don't know if one-way functions exist. Um, most people assume and accept that P is not equal to NP and one-way functions exist, but it's not something that you can really take for granted. Okay, so uh, to sum it up, the idea behind one-way functions is that for all reasonable use cases, you're not going to be able to invert it better than random guessing, right? And that's the significance of having like one over the polynomial is that if you're less than this for all polynomials, you're basically no better than random guessing, right? Um, and then as an extra note, we're often going to care about one-way permutations, which is going to be one WP instead of one WF. Um, and basically what a one-way permutation is, it's a one-way function that's bijective, right? So over here on the right, this is a permutation. And the main thing is like, everything is going to be taken to some distinct um, input, right? So every input will be mapped to some other input and everything maps somewhere exactly once and gets mapped exactly once. Um, yeah. No questions? Okay, cool. All right, next topic is hardcore bits, right? Um, so it's a very interesting result. It's potentially very confusing as well. So we're just gonna focus on the result more, not as much on the proof, um, cause that can get like very distracting if you don't really understand what's going on. Um, but our motivation for this is kind of a shortcoming of one-way functions, right? So if we look at the statement of one-way functions, there's this red circle here that's, um, and inside we've got this statement that says, there exists some n sub c in n, right? And so what it's saying is this one-way function is hard to invert on very long inputs, right? And these very long inputs are also going to give very long outputs. But we don't want to have to deal with bit strings that are like millions of bits long, right? We want to deal with like maybe one bit at a time in the best case, right? because we want as much granularity as possible when we're dealing with cryptographic stuff. Um, so we want to get rid of this big end of the C and we want to make it like as small as possible. 
All right, so it turns out that we can make it as small as theoretically possible by just making it one bit. And the idea of a hardcore bit is that if I give you a one-way function f, there's going to be a one-bit function, right? So it's going to take in a long string, a string of length n, and it's going to output a single bit such that if I give you f of x, the probability that you output b of x correctly um, is going to be very small in a certain sense, right? So hopefully you guys are thinking like, how could outputting the correct bit be very hard, right? Like that's flipping a coin, right? If you just guess randomly, you're gonna have a probability one half of guessing this, right? So what we really wanna say is the probability that when I give some adversary f of x, the probability that they output the correct value, the correct value b of x is going to be less than random guessing plus the reciprocal of some polynomial, right? So the key is we're allowing this baseline of random guessing, but we're not giving them any more. Um, so again, just like a formalized version of what we just said, um, the probability that an adversary can predict the hardcore bit given the output of the function is less than random guessing plus some negligible amount. All right. So the sense in which hardcore bits are as good as one-way functions is that it turns out if you can predict a hardcore bit, then you can use whatever program you use to predict the hardcore bit to invert the one-way function, right? So as long as you have a one-way function, basically what we're saying is you just can't predict the one, the hardcore bit. Um, all right, so this theorem is from Goldreich and Levin. If you wanna look into it more, um, there's like a lot of theory behind this, but basically the idea is if I give you a one-way function F, you can make a one-way function G that essentially does the same thing, but it also has a hardcore bit, right? So F is going to take one input X, but G is gonna take that same input plus some random string of the same length. And it's just gonna output the same thing as F, but then it's just gonna spit back out the random string without having done anything to it. And then the hardcore bit for G will be the inner product of X and R, right? So this is going to be the same dot product that you know from like 33a, I think it is. Um, so for example, right, if we gave B the bit string X and R, where X is like 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, and R is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, those are the same length, right? Yeah. So the dot product of these, if you just write them like vectors, Uh, we're going to be doing everything mod two, right? Whoops. So um, this first product is zero, second product zero, third product is one, fourth product is zero, and then we have a zero, one, zero, right? And then as you remember, like we add these all up when we're done with the dot product and adding these up mod two, there's two ones. So this is going to be zero, right? So the inner product on these two inputs is zero. And that's like how this hardcore bit works. Any questions? All right, cool. So the point of this definition is that it's going to allow for a very natural method if we want to use, um, if there's some adversary that does predict this hardcore bit, this definition makes it very natural for us to use that adversary to just go straight ahead and invert the function, right? So I'm not gonna show you the whole proof because there's like a lot of theoretical computer science um, machinery and like probability bounds in there. Um, but we can do like kind of a small exercise to see 
how this would work in theory, right? So imagine I gave you an adversary that when you give it the output of this one-way function G, it predicts the hardcore bit with 100% probability, right? So we can draw A like a box and it's gonna take in one string, which is like presumably F of X and another string, which is presumably R. And it's gonna give you an output, which would be the hardcore bit given X and R, right? And it's gonna do this with 100% accuracy, right? So whatever it tells you, you know is absolutely true. And the key is you can give it whatever you want, right? You could just give it a bunch of zeros. It doesn't actually have to be the output of this one-way function on any input, but with 100% accuracy, it will tell you what the answer would have been had you given it proper input, right? So does anyone have any ideas how we would use this to our advantage if we want to invert the one-way function? I'll just like add a reminder that this is the inner product of X and R. Think about how the dot product works, maybe. I'll give it like five more seconds. Okay. All right, if no one has any ideas, basically the point here is if you take the dot product of something with a vector that's all zeros everywhere, except it's a one somewhere else, that's just going to give you the ith entry of x, right? So like, let's say this one is in the ith spot. Uh, when we take the dot product of this vector with x, that's just gonna give you xi, right? So we'll take each of these vectors one by one and put them through f. Uh, I'll call this vector like e sub i. I think that's the normal notation. Um, so we'll take f of e sub i. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass f of e sub i into a. Oh, wait, just kidding. Um, terrible mistake. Uh, so we want to invert it on X, right? So we have some, we've been given some F of X, right? So we're going to pass that in. And then we're going to pass the standard basis vector E sub I in, right? And our adversary with 100% accuracy is going to spit out the hardcore bit of X and E sub I, which is just X sub I, right? So as we let i range over all of the entries of x, so e1, e2, through e of the size of x, what the adversary is going to give us is bit by bit every single entry of x, right? So at the end, what we're going to have is x. So essentially, we've used this adversary to perfectly invert the one-way function. Does everybody like kind of see what we did there? Okay, feel free to stop me if there are any questions. Um, but yeah, so this is like the summary of what we just did. Um, this is something you can look at more. It's kind of like a hand wavy version of this. Um, like really, if you were to do it with this level of accuracy, there's a little bit more um, care that would have to go into the proof. And there's even more care needed when you wanna do it with like the actual value of one half plus epsilon. Um, but this is just here for reference if you're curious. So to sum it up, right, we already have one-way functions which give us something hard to invert. But the key is they're only hard to invert on massive inputs and massive outputs, right? So we want to use hardcore bits to give us the granularity we need to like actually work with things. OK, so next topic building off of both of those is pseudo random generators. Uh, you probably know these um, maybe from Minecraft, right? Like every Minecraft world is created using a random seed and a pseudo random generator. Um, so the main reason we care about PRGs is because of one time pads, which is the same stream cipher that Jerry mentioned earlier. I know everyone was like kind of shitting on these a second ago, right? Like who would use a stream cipher? What's the point? You can get the same with block ciphers. Um, but Shannon, Claude Shannon, who I think like founded um, information theory, uh, proved that these are basically 
the only encryption scheme you can use that offers perfect secrecy, right? So as long as you have a random key, um, so remember it's like key XOR with plain text. As long as your key is random, your plain text, like given the cipher text, imagine you're trying to figure out what the plain text is. If you know the key is random, that means every plain text that's the same length as the cipher text is equally likely, right? So that means you don't know anything about the plain text given the cipher text. Maybe you could narrow it down to things that like make sense in English, but theoretically it could just be pure gibberish, right? And so that's the reason why one-time pads are like so strong in the theoretical sense because they offer this information theoretic security, meaning that everything is equally likely uh, synonymous with this other term, perfect secrecy. Okay, so a lot of you may be thinking like, you know, um, PRGs, I'm familiar with them. I know they'll never be as good as true randomness, but the point here is that they're gonna be more efficient, right? They're gonna be more feasible. Um, if, you're, if you know how much better true randomness is than PRGs in general, then you probably know how much more resource intensive generating true randomness is. Um, so the point is using PRGs is more efficient and more feasible. And even, um, even if they're not as good as true randomness, they're gonna be good enough for all intents and purposes, right? All right, so moving on to indistinguishability. The main point here is that we want our outputs from a PRG to not be distinguishable from true randomness by some adversary that uses a polynomial amount of space, right? Basically, there's no like feasible machine on this planet that uses greater than a polynomial amount of space. So as long as we're indistinguishable to an adversary that uses P space, then we're good. All right, so it's time for some probability. So everyone buckle up. Um, it's gonna get a little wild. Um, so we're gonna start with a couple definitions. Don't let these scare you. I will explain a little more in a second. So a probability ensemble is a sequence of distributions indexed by a security parameter, which is gonna be the length of the strings in the distribution, right? So X, big X here is gonna be the sequence like X1, X2, X3, Xn, all the way up to infinity. And the only thing you need to know about Xn is it outputs n bit strings, right? Okay. So we're going to say that two probability ensembles are computationally indistinguishable if whatever distinguisher you take is not going to be able to tell them apart um, with any non negligible probability, right? Um, and so this definition maybe looks kind of daunting. So I will explain it really quickly. So basically imagine we've got our distinguisher D and we feed it samples from X sub N, right? So this would be um, its probability of outputting one on X sub one or on X sub two and so on and so forth. And you can see it kind of gradually decreases, right? And if we feed it samples from Y sub N, um, maybe those, the probability of outputting one on those is going to increase as n increases, right? So what we want is we're going to subtract those to see the difference between these two distributions according to this distinguisher. And you can see it kind of goes down as the length of the string gets longer, right? So as the length of the string gets longer, this distinguisher is doing a worse and worse job of telling them apart, right? And then the key is whatever, um, reciprocal polynomial we take, eventually these two um, distributions or ensembles are going to dip below that, right? So the reciprocal polynomial, whatever reciprocal polynomial we choose, there's going to be some corresponding n so that as long as the strings are longer than that, the probability that this distinguisher tells them apart is going to be less than the curve given by that reciprocal polynomial, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. No, so the distinguisher is just going to be a machine, right? So 
the distinguisher has like maybe some Oracle or someone feeding it inputs from a random distribution. And when you give it an input, it's just going to say, oh, you gave me that input. I think it's from distribution one, or I think it's from distribution zero, right? And so as these inputs get longer, the idea is it's not going to be able to tell as well whether this string came from distribution zero or from distribution one. And so the probability of outputting one on both distributions is going to like converge and get really, really close. OK. So just like revisiting, um, you can see like everything corresponds. Um, yeah, I guess without the animations, not, there's not that much of a point to the slide. Uh, but OK, so maybe you haven't had that much time to really think about what's going on here. But if we were like doing a full course, like maybe you will see this if you do 183 or 282. Um, hopefully there's like something inherently disturbing about this definition, right? Like you're basically giving this distinguisher a single coin toss and you're saying, is this coin fair or unfair or something like that, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess I kind of gave it away, but does anybody know what might be inherently disturbing about the way we're treating distinguishability? Um, it's just like categorizing inputs, basically. It doesn't like it doesn't necessarily inherently mean anything. Like you could have a really bad distinguisher that just always says one. Uh, but the idea is like a good distinguisher, like maybe a perfect distinguisher, if you gave it a sample from Xn, it might always say zero. And if you gave it a sample from Yn, it might always say uh, one, right? Um, okay, well, so ideally the concerning thing about the definition is that we're really only getting one sample, right? Imagine I gave you a coin and I said, flip this coin once and then tell me if it's biased towards heads or tails. Like really you would probably maybe want 100, maybe a thousand coin tosses before you tell me like this one's biased towards heads or this one's biased towards tails, right? So why would one sample be enough? Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and address your concerns by now for now by saying, you know what, I'll go ahead and I'll give you multiple samples. Actually, I'll give you polynomially many samples, right? So if these random distributions are generating length and strings, I'll give you P of N um, experiments where P is some polynomial. Okay. Um, so just for a side-by-side -side comparison, essentially the only difference between this definition and the previous one is the number of samples, right? Everything else is the same. Um, there's this QN here, but essentially that's the same as N to the C because um, we're talking about like orders of growth for polynomials. Um, and then an extended statistical test is just a distinguisher that takes in polynomial, polynomially many samples. Um, and then it's still going to produce a binary output, basically saying these samples were from this distribution or these samples were from that distribution. Um, are there more questions? Okay. So it's pretty clear that if two samples, two ensembles are indistinguishable by repeated experiments, then they're also going to be indistinguishable by one experiment, right? Because one experiment is definitely going to be weaker than multiple experiments, right? Um, but as it turns out, if they're distinguishable by repeated experiments, then they're also going to be distinguishable by a single experiment, meaning like it seems obvious that a single experiment is weaker, right? But as it turns out, it's going to be just as strong. Um, so we're going to introduce this thing called the hybrid argument. This is another like central thing in cryptography these days, right alongside uh, one-way functions. Um, I will add like the people who originally worked on things like lattices and ECC are not a huge fan of the hybrid argument, but um, can't have everything. And hybrid argument is still huge in cryptography because essentially the main idea of the hybrid argument is like, if you have two things that are essentially the same, then composing like 
larger buildings out of those two things, like the big buildings um, that you make out of those two things will also be essentially the same. Okay, so imagine you have two things and they're both composed of smaller pieces, right? So like we put one thing here and another thing here and um, they're gonna be composed of smaller pieces. And then we're gonna convert one into the other one step at a time, right? So we'll like take this piece and turn it into a red piece. Um, and then we'll take this piece and turn it into a red piece and so on and so forth down the line. Um, and so we'll get like these intermediate things called hybrids, right? So the first one will have a single red piece, second one will have two, so on and so forth, right? And so these intermediate steps are gonna be called our hybrids. Um, and the main idea of the hybrid argument is if these two are distinguishable, then there's got to be two neighboring hybrids in the intermediate steps that are also distinguishable, right? So um, you can kind of see like the power of that is something that's telling these two big things apart is essentially really only focused on one part of them. Um, so like if you want to think about anamorphs, right? Um, at this end, you've got this weird alien centaur thing. And at this end, you just have a normal like hawk or falcon or something. And as you go through, you're changing like smaller pieces of them. And like, depending on what you see, like maybe you're focused on the beak here, right? Like I can tell this apart from this. And so it would be equivalent according to the hybrid argument to say like, I can tell that we've got a beak here and then no beak here. So these two must be changing in some way. Um, yeah, so as I said before, basically like imagine we've got our hybrids, right? So the first one is all blue and the second one might have one red spot. Um, and then somewhere down the line, we're going, we're switching this one spot from blue to red. And then all the way at the end, we have our all red. Uh, object, right? And so what the hybrid argument is saying is basically, if you just focus on this position, you'll do just as well as something that focuses on the whole thing all at once, right? So it reduces trying to juggle a lot of things and all their differences to just focusing on one part and how it differs um, between the two distributions, right? Okay, so quick review, you probably learned this in geometry or something. Um, so if P implies Q, um, you can think of that like a Venn diagram, right? So if you're in P, then you must also be in Q because like Q surrounds P. And equivalently, you could say, well, if I'm not in Q, then P is inside Q. So that must mean that I'm not in P, right? So it's equivalent to say that P implies Q or not Q implies not P. Um, and the hybrid argument inherently implies doing a proof by contrapositive, which hopefully you've seen. Um, but basically the idea is you prove this statement P implies Q by instead proving not Q implies not P, which is the same thing. Um, and the idea is like, um, you're gonna go from something that's distinguishable when composed of many parts and use the hybrid argument to prove that it's distinguishable when it's only composed of one piece. And that's gonna be equivalent to saying like, being able to tell these single pieces apart is equivalent to telling apart the whole um, compound. All right, so let me try to speed through this. Um, we're just gonna really quickly flip the definition from computationally indistinguishable to computationally distinguishable, right? Um, and that's going to allow us to start our proof by contrapositive. Um, all right, so the first thing we're going to do is make hybrids between the repeated samples, right? So we can call our first hybrid H0, and it'll just consist of all Xs, right? And then gradually, we'll swap the Xs for Ys. So in hybrid number K, 
um, the kth spot will be the last y, right? So like hk um, has yn1, yn2, up through yNk, and then it's going to start being x's. So xn k plus one all the way up through the end, right? Um, I think I did it the other way in the notes. Yeah, so in the notes, I started with y's and then ended up with x's. But the point is there's a hybrid on one end which is all X's and a hybrid on the other end, which is all Y's, right? Okay, so time for a little bit of geometry slash analysis review. Um, hopefully the jump from here to here doesn't feel too much like um, this meme on the right-hand side. But basically the idea is if you're moving from one point to another in a series of like small steps, um, like the sum of the lengths of these individual steps has to add up to at least the total distance, right? Like if you take a bunch of steps and the distance you traveled in each step doesn't add up to the full distance that you wanted to travel, but like there's no way you got to your destination. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to break this down into hybrids, right? So we'll say the probability that D on the zeroth hybrid equals one minus the probability on the first hybrid equals one. And then we'll add that back, right? And then we'll continue like subtracting and adding back things until we just subtract this final value, which would be like the probability of D outputting one on the final hybrid. Right, and so this total value is gonna be at least one over Q to the N. And we can also separate out the individual steps, which would be like, this would be one step. Um, and then like this and this together would be one step and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a little clearer here, hopefully. Um, right, so this is the last hybrid. This is the first hybrid. We basically subtract and add back every hybrid in between. And then we're going to break it down into the individual steps, right? And so we know that this breakdown into the individual steps must be at least the lower bound that we started with. Um, so that's the important part here. So let me just double check what we're doing. Um, OK, just like for notation's sake, um, we're going to like label these steps. Um, okay. So the probability that the probability step from the K minus first hybrid to the Kth hybrid, uh, I'm just gonna call that Delta K, right? And so from our last slide, this is, um, this is like delta pn and this is delta one, right? So all I'm saying is like delta one plus delta two all the way up through the last delta. Like just think of these as individual steps. These have to add up to at least the total distance we traveled, right? Okay. And then we took like a finite number of steps. So one of these has to be the biggest step that we took. So we can just say like, without loss of generality, delta K is the biggest step we took, right? And the total distance we traveled has to be less than the biggest step we took times the number of steps we took, right? That means that delta K itself is gonna be bigger than or equal to one over Q of N times P of N, right? But both of these are polynomials, right? So what do you guys know happens when we multiply two polynomials together, what do you get? You get another polynomial, right? So we might as well just call this big Q of N, right? So the point is we've got some difference here and it's bigger than the reciprocal of some polynomial, right? And so if we take another look back at the definition, this is exactly what we said distinguishable meant, right? If we have some difference um, in probabilities between two things that is bigger than the reciprocal of some polynomial, then we would call those two things distinguishable, right? 
And so, as we said, right, delta k is going to be bigger than or equal to the reciprocal of this polynomial, but delta k is just equal to these differences. This should be a k, and this should be a k. Um, all right, so it almost looks like we're done, but there's a small problem, right? These hybrids are not distributions. Like, they're not even samples from distributions. We took a bunch of samples from x and a bunch of samples from y, but there's no one saying, like, if you take a bunch of samples from X and a bunch of samples from Y, that's as good as some other distribution. Like we don't even know if that works, right? Like maybe X outputs only zeros and Y outputs only ones. Like what kind of distribution would output zero for the first K and then just like one for the rest of eternity? Probably no distribution. Um, so we're not worried about them being distributions. The point is that they differ in only one spot, right? And so, all that our distinguisher needs to focus on is this single location, right? And the only way it's going to possibly be able to tell these two hybrids apart is by focusing on the single location, right? So imagine we have our distinguisher, right? And we have to feed it polynomially many samples, right? So we've got, um, I'll just call it Z1, Z2, up through Z of P of N. And we're going to feed that into our distinguisher. And it's going to say one if it thinks that these are from x of n. And it's going to say zero if it thinks these are from y of n, right? So how could we use d to tell us what a single sample is? Any ideas? Think of the hybrids we just made. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and go through this. Um, so we're going to essentially make a hybrid, right? So we're going to fill in the first k minus one inputs with x's. And then we're going to put our unknown sample z in there. And then we're going to fill the rest of the inputs with y's. All right. Ready? Here we go. So basically, we don't know which one our sample is from, but we know that no matter which one it's from, it's going to make one of the hybrids that our distinguisher could tell apart, right? So since our distinguisher can tell apart these hybrids and their only difference is in this one location where we put Z, essentially that's doing the same thing as telling us which distribution Z is from, right? So telling apart two hybrids, which only differ in one spot, is the same as telling apart a single sample, which you could just drop into that one spot, right? So what this is telling us is we really only need one sample. Okay. So the main takeaways are that one sample is good enough to tell if two distributions are indistinguishable. And the bigger takeaway would be the hybrid argument, right? Because this is important for like all of modern cryptography. Okay. Um, I think I will come back to this later. Basically the idea is we're gonna make a PRG. Um, if you're interested, you can find Bloom and Macaulay's paper. Um, but basically the idea is we're gonna make a PRG out of hardcore bits, right? And as it's gonna turn out, um, if you're able to predict the next bit that this PRG spits out, that's going to be as good as predicting a hardcore bit, which we already showed is as good as um, inverting a one-way function, right? Um, but that's not quite good enough um, because what we really want to show is that the PRG creates a distribution that's essentially the same as true randomness. And we just showed that nobody can predict the next bit that the PR, PRG will output, right? So once again, we kind of have this dichotomy of, we want something that involves a lot of parts, but we only have something that deals with one part, right? And so this is just like screaming a hybrid argument, right? We're gonna use the hybrid argument to show that being computationally indistinguishable from random is the same as not being able to predict the next bit, right? And so, um, there's some intuitive reasoning here. You guys can come back to that later. I want to get to some more interesting stuff though. Um, 
And like, here's the full rigorous proof that not being able to predict the next bit is as good as being essentially truly random. Um, and so like the point here is theoretical PRGs are for all reasonable uses as good as randomness. Uh, they do require one-way permutations, um, which is an even stronger assumption than one-way functions. Um, and then like as an add-on to this last point, the hybrid argument is very cool. Okay, a uh, quick digression into homomorphic encryption. Uh, I'm gonna go back to group theory for a second. Basically, you have a group with an operator star. A homomorphism is a function that, as you would say in the business, preserves the operation, right? So if you do the operation before you apply the function, that's the same as doing the operation after you apply the function. Um, so the big deal with homomorphic encryption is you can operate on encrypted values, which is very cool, right? Um, it can be dangerous sometimes, like if you're trying to hold an online auction, you don't want people to know what other people's bids are. If you use homomorphic encryption, people could just like add one to other people's bids to make sure they win, which is not fun for anyone. Um, and then another note is these are often not one-to-one -one in order to avoid trivial decryption, right? Like imagine I gave you an encryption key and you knew the field we were working on, you just go ahead and encrypt everything. And then if I give you an encrypted value, you know immediately what it is because you've already encrypted everything. So it's not one-to-one. -one. There's gonna be multiple encryptions of every value. So you don't know what I'm sending you when it's encrypted. Um, but yeah, that's the main idea. So we're gonna use this to build something really cool called oblivious transfer. Um, so the basic idea is we've got Alice on one side and she's got two values. Um, for whatever reason, Bob wants one of them. Bob doesn't know what they are, but he wants one of them. And he's just gonna say, I want B, which is a zero or a one. And somehow he's going to get X sub B. But here's the trick. Um, Alice should not learn anything about B, right? And Bob should not learn anything about the item that he doesn't get. Um, so this might look really hard, right? If we just let Alice send both of them all the way through, um, we can maybe trust Bob to just pick one of them that he wants and leave the other one untouched and like forget about it. Um, but we don't really trust him to forget about it. And we don't really trust him to just pick up the one that he wants. Um, but on the other hand, if we let Bob send B, then Alice can send back the one that he wants. But the issue there is then Alice learns B and she knows which one Bob picked up. So we don't want either of them to know these things. Um, this is gonna be more important like later for multi-party computation, but um, we just like don't want either of them to learn these things. And the way we're gonna make that happen is by oblivious transfer, right? And so, Oblivious transfer um, in this construction will use homomorphic encryption. Um, again, we're preserving the operation. So Bob is gonna send Alice an encryption key. Uh, then we're gonna trust him to take his bit, flip it. So one of these is zero, right? One of them is one and one of them is zero. Um, and he's gonna encrypt both of those and then send them as a pair, right? And then what Alice is gonna do she's going to encrypt her values x0 and x1 and multiply them by the values in the encrypted pair, right? So the point is one of these values is an encryption of zero, right? And when you multiply an encryption of something by an encryption of zero, that's the same thing as having an encryption of something, which is just an encryption of zero, right? And if you open an encryption of zero, you don't learn anything. Basically you learn, I mean, it's a zero and he already knew it was a zero before. So he doesn't learn anything. And the fact that Alice can't invert this homomorphic encryption means she doesn't learn anything about B. Um, the problem here is we can't really trust Bob to actually send a zero and a one. Uh, Cause if he sends a one and a one, there's no way Alice could know. And Alice will just send back an encryption of both of her values multiplied by one and Bob can open both of them and learn both of the values. Um, so as with a lot of cryptography these days, we're just going to throw a one-way proof at this or a zero knowledge 
proof, sorry, not one win proof. We're gonna throw a zero knowledge proof at this and then suddenly it works, right? So basically Bob is gonna send his encryptions and then he's gonna provide a zero knowledge proof that one of these is zero, right? If you're not familiar with it, the basic idea of a zero knowledge proof is you prove something is true without revealing anything other than the fact that the statement is true. Um, of course, you can't do this with full certainty. So you do it with like a really high probability, um, but it turns out any statement in NP has a zero knowledge proof protocol. So as long as you can verify a statement in polynomial time, given the answer, you know that you can do a zero knowledge proof for it. All right, so the point is OT works. Um, you can use it to make one out of N OT, not that exciting. Um, you can do it to use, you can use it to do multi-party computation, which is slightly more exciting. And it's also a complete cryptographic primitive, which is even more exciting. Basically what that means is once you have OT, you can build whatever else you want. It's not necessarily going to be efficient because you're doing OT all the time, but you can build whatever else you want out of it. Okay, one out of NOT is here if you guys want to look at it, but I want to get to MPC before it gets too late. So multi-party computation. Um, this is a really big deal these days. Um, basically, imagine you have two parties. They have private inputs. Uh, maybe they're credit card companies and they're not allowed to share their user data. Maybe they're big tech companies and they have like some proprietary information they don't want each other to know. Either way, they both want to know the answer to this function because it would make them both better off, but they can't share their individual data, right? So we're going to reinterpret this function as a circuit. Uh, we'll use XOR and multiplication or AND gates. Um, if you remember from M51A, these form a universal set, which means you're guaranteed to be able to uh, write F as a circuit. And basically you'll represent a circuit as a tree um, where the nodes will be the operation you're doing and the leaves will be like the starting inputs. All right, so the first step is we're going to change all the inputs to additive secret shares. And that, basic, that basically means like for value X, player one is going to hold some value A and player two is gonna hold some value B. And these will add up to X, but there should be no way that player one can know player two's value or X um, without having one of them, right? So like if player one didn't already know X, there's no way for player two, player one to figure out player two's value, like besides just guessing. All right. So the goal is we're gonna start with secret shares and we're gonna make more secret shares all the way to the top. And then our final answer is gonna be secret share and both players will reveal their secrets to each other and then end up with the answer. And the point is, if everything is secret shared all the way through the middle of the tree, then they can't have any idea what's going on in the middle. They only know their original input and the final output, right? So uh, for the addition gates, right? So X is shared between player one and player two as A and B, and Y is shared as C and D. So player one has A and C, and player two has B and D. Um, and we want additive secret sharing. So we want them to each hold secrets that add up to Z. So essentially what we're just gonna do is we're gonna make player one secret A plus C and player two secret B plus D. And that'll just, that'll be it. That's the secret share, um, really easy. They don't even have to communicate to make this work. Um, the harder one is multiplication, right? Because if player one has A and two has B and then we have C and D for Y, um, Z is going to be equal to this FOIL product, right? A plus B times C plus D. Um, then if you remember from middle school, AC plus BD plus AD plus, oops, BC, right? So A and C are both held by player one. So we're good there, right? Player one can just multiply them on their own. Uh, player two can just multiply B and D. Uh, but these two are a little bit trickier, right? Like if we want player two to end up with AD, then it seems like the most straightforward way to do this is just for player one to send A. Um, but if player one sends A, then player two knows A and B, and that allows them to know X, right? So that's revealing an intermediate value, which is a big no-no. 
Um, so we have to find some way, essentially, to get player two the result of B times C or A times D without learning C or A and without player one learning B. So hopefully this is like ringing bells from OT a few minutes ago, right? So what we're gonna use is of course OT, right? So what Alice is gonna do, player one over here, is going to, is she's gonna compute both possible outputs, right? So she's gonna say, well, if Bob has a zero, then the result of this multiplication is gonna be C times zero. And if Bob has a one, the result of this multiplication is gonna be C times one. And remember, like we can also do one out of N OT. So like if Bob has a two bit value, she could do it for zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Um, however she does it, basically she will send all of these into the OT box. Bob will retrieve only the one that corresponds to his value. And then um, he will end up with the result of the multiplication. Um, so this is almost right. It's bad for a very key reason that might not be that obvious. Um, but what could Bob learn from this? Any ideas? Imagine Bob has a one. What does he learn? If if B equals one, then C times B is going to be equal to C, right? So if B equals one, then every single time, Bob is going to learn Alice's input and that's gonna give away a secret share, which is bad news. Um, so we need to do a little bit of tweaking to fix this. Oh, did someone say it in the chat? Okay. Um, so we need to do a little bit of tweaking to fix this. And as always, um, like, Maybe think about one-time pads, just the idea of masking, right? So what Alice is gonna do is she's just gonna add a random number to both of these results, right? And so Bob is gonna get the true result plus some random number. Uh, really it's just zero or one. But the idea here is since it's random zero or one, um, we're gonna have some true value T plus or XOR with zero or one equal probably and that equal probably will give us the not of the result, or I guess the true result if it's zero or the not of the result if it's one, right? So Bob will get one of these with 50-50 chance. So Bob really has no idea what the true result is, right? And Alice has no idea what B is because OT works. Um, so Alice is going to hold on to this R and Bob is going to hold on to CB plus R. And since we're working mod two, the R's are gonna cancel out when they add them back together. So we now have a secret share of CB. Um, so the idea is we're gonna do this for CB and AD, right? So as we said before, Alice is gonna multiply AC on her own. Bob is gonna multiply BD on his own. Then Alice is gonna hold on to an R and Bob is going to get CB plus R. And then for AD, Alice is going to hold on to some S or R prime, if you like. I'll just use S. Um, and Bob is going to get AD plus S, right? And the key is when we add these all together, the Rs will cancel because we're working mod two. The Ss will cancel because we're working mod two. And we'll just get AC plus BD plus BC plus AD. And that is going to be um, the value that we want Z. So this is how you make a multiplicative secret share. Are there questions? I noticed the chat kind of exploded. Uh, I, I... Okay, okay. All right, so summing it up, um, the idea here is that MBC can be done by converting functions into circuits of adding and multiplying mod two in addition to one, two, OT, right? So MPC, as I mentioned before, it's good for operating on private information, right? So if you have private user information or proprietary database, um, that's what it's good for. It's also good for creating other cryptographic protocols, right? So if you have something like hard-coded into your hardware um, and you don't want someone to be able to reverse engineer it based on the accesses to memory, like for example, um, most of you have taken 32 at this point, you're familiar with like max heaps and trees and linked lists and arrays and stuff. Um, if you looked at the way that a machine went into its RAM, you might be able to tell that it's doing heap sort, right? And so oblivious RAM is kind of like 
an idea of restructuring how a machine uses RAM so that you wouldn't be able to tell those kinds of things. Uh, private information retrieval is similar, but it's like for accessing a database, you don't want to, you don't want people be, to be able to see your queries and figure out what's going on with someone else's life just based on the queries you're making to the database. Yeah. So can I just back to the first workshop? Uh, yeah. So uh, I know for like AI security and federated learning, we also mm -hmm. do that in the CIO role. Mm -hmm. uh, how does like that sort of help us operation with security? Yeah, so I mean, as we mentioned, right, um, any circuit that you could ever want to compute can be encoded using like some universal set of gates, but what they probably do, which I'll get to in a second, is use garbled circuits, right? Which is a much more efficient way to do it in a certain sense, um, because in most of CS, the bottleneck of everything is communication, right? Like when you're working on your computer, IO is a huge bottleneck because it has to go through the kernel and everything. Um, if you're talking with someone on the other side of the country, you can do a bunch of computations on your computer in the time that it takes a message just to get there, not even to get back, right? Um, so garbled circuits kind of gets around all the OT we've been doing. Um, yeah, so it's one of the other things to look into. I'll do garbled circuits first. So basically the idea of garbled circuits is you convert your function into a circuit. Um, and then you encode the circuit, you encrypt the circuit, right? So player one is going to make circuit. Um, and then they're going to encrypt. Uh, and then they'll send an encryption key. And they will send the circuit as well. Um, the encrypted circuit, I mean. And they will also send their encrypted inputs, right? And player two is going to use this key to encrypt their inputs, right? And then the idea is this circuit should be encrypted so well, the player two can just go ahead and compute things and just have absolutely no idea what's going on the whole time. What's that? The building's closed, guys. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's like 20 minutes after oh. this session. Too. OK. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just to wrap up, basically, you um, compute it encrypted, send it back, decrypt it, and that's the idea. Um, if you're interested in like following up on any of the things I mentioned, this is just a list of topics that you could look into. Um, but yeah. All right. Let's give a big round of applause. Let us know if you have any questions. <clears throat>